Welcome to Vet Zone, where passion for animals, science, and medicine lives. The odd reason ticks bother me. As I studied the respiration of ticks, I found the process uncomfortable. At first, I couldn't figure out why I felt my lips purse, noticed some tension in my back, and found my focus returning to the cheap faux leather of my armrest. I wanted distance, to go for a walk, or just to go anywhere. This didn't occur while reading about their disgusting feeding behavior. And when I say disgusting, I don't even think Caligula ripped through flesh and nonstop sucked blood while having sex. I could be wrong, he was pretty sick. Still, when I ran across the tick respiration vocabulary, spherical, subostial space, atrium, atrial valve, trachea, it hit me. Hey, I have some of those. Granted, I'm pretty sure I don't have a subostial space and wouldn't show it to anyone if I did, but I have a trachea, I have that. And while the atrium and corresponding valve refers to the tick's air-filled space rather than the mammalian heart anatomy, the terms felt familiar and more importantly, wrongfully appropriated. Like discovering someone you hate has the same favorite song or movie. I don't mind learning weird words like subostial space, but please don't take parts of my anatomy and tie them with something as gross as a tick. Perhaps it isn't the baseness of the tick that offends me, but how small and inconsequential they seem in the grand scheme of it all. Am I that small comparatively in the universe? On the other hand, am I that amazing either? Some ticks feed two to three times in their life, which spans years. They can breathe underwater for up to two weeks and have out-survived the dinosaurs with little changes to their genetics. Talk about survivors. Leonardo da Vinci said that simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. Despite all the fancy terms associated with their breathing, ticks have a simple breathing system, but one that allows ticks to breathe both on land and underwater. Most arthropods use specialized holes called spiracles to breathe through. Ticks have spiracular plates, which transforms the large hole of the spiracle into a ring of small pores or aeropiles. Yes, even a small hole must be renamed by scientists, hence aeropile. The plate looks like a racetrack, with aeropiles speckling the track, and the inward island, much like a real racetrack, remains non-functional. The holes lead to a labyrinth of interconnecting tubes, which help keep water out and moisture in. The tubes collect air in the sub space, the ostium being the unused island in the plate center, and the space being that beneath it. Another space lies beneath the sub space, known as the atrium, and the two are separated by the atrial valve. The tick opens and closes the valve as needed. When not feeding, they open once or twice an hour, for just a few minutes, but can remain constantly open when feeding. The atrial space empties into tracheal trunks, often five, which then continue to split into smaller and smaller tracheal tubes, and finally tracheoles. Chitin forms the support of these tubes, just as chitin forms their exoskeleton. The terminal tracheoles represent sacs where gas exchange occurs. Like humans, they wish to absorb oxygen and release carbon dioxide. These sacs touch nearly every cell in their body. Our lungs also terminate with sacs, called alveoli, where gas exchange occurs. For mammals, we oxygenate our blood in a single organ, the lung, and then use our closed circulatory system to reach out to distant cells and provide oxygen. Arthropods utilize a more direct route. They basically breathe at the level of every cell. Thus, their entire body acts as a lung, or oxygen sponge. This doesn't alleviate the need for the heart, though. Even ticks have hearts. They use it to pump hemolymph, or tick blood, through their open system and bathe their cells in nutrients and necessary ions. Unlike us, most arthropods do not use their blood to transport oxygen, 
as their tracheal system provides direct oxygen access to their cells. Some large animals like horseshoe crabs and tarantulas represent exceptions to this and will transfer oxygen via a copper-based hemoglobin-like molecule known as hemocyanin within their blood. Within this ingenious tracheal system lies their weakness as an alpha predator. By relying on direct oxygen respiration, arthropods have limited their size, and by extension, their chance to be at the top of the food chain. The dinosaur days of 35% oxygen have lapsed, and with the current meager atmosphere of 21%, the days of two-foot-long dragonflies have long since passed. So if you wake up at night from dreams containing badger-sized spiders, no need to fear. However, don't let all of your fear go. Fear is good. We need it. In exchange for giving up top dog status, ticks gained a flexible parasitic niche that provides near immortality, and with it, the pathogens that take advantage of them, like Lyme disease, Ehrlichia, and Powassan virus. Marcus Aurelius pondered, What is man? A bit of flesh? A bit of breath? and a wisdom to rule all. We may share the first two qualities with ticks, but the third is uniquely human, and may be our salvation. Despite human stupidity, our capacity for wisdom exists, and gives me comfort that I might be more than a tick. Thus, we'll end with the words of Shakespeare, which, despite their intended sarcasm, contained a ring of truth. What a piece of work is man! How noble in reason! How infinite in faculties, in form and moving, how express and admirable, in actions, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god. Thank you for listening.